Thank you for joining us. The ever-changing situation in the Middle East is unfortunately always a subject of great concern, and the Shalom Show has continuously covered events there since 1979. I've had the privilege of interviewing many Israeli and other leaders, including Benjamin Netanyahu, Shimon Peres, Yitzhak Rabin, and others from all walks of life. Our guest today, Mr. Chaim Katzman, was born in Israel and has a close understanding of the challenges there. He is the founder and chairman of Gazit Globe, and he shares our hope for peaceful solutions and mutual cooperation in the Middle East and worldwide, of course. Mr. Katzman will share his thoughts on these subjects following these messages. Deep in Israel's Arava Desert, there is an oasis of hope. Here, students from across the Middle East and around the world are being provided with the knowledge and skills they need to protect the environment they share. Everybody needs resources, everybody needs water, everybody needs air, it doesn't matter where you're from. Israelis and Arabs, Jews, Muslims and Christians, future leaders united by the belief that nature knows no borders. Today and every day, lives are being changed and the future is being rewritten at the Arava Institute. Find out more about our purpose, programs, and people at www.friendsofarava.org. Join us, because nature and hope know no borders. With us now is Chaim Katzman. Chaim, it's a pleasure to have you back Likewise. on the show. Thank you, Richard, for having me. Good Lord, it's been a few years since the last one. A little while. I think the first time was, good Lord, about 20-something years ago. We were slightly younger, the two of us. And, and slightly... luckily, the statute of limitation ran, ran on this one. <laughs> Interesting. Well, anyway, I'd like to ask you about Israel and the current situation and the way you see it. You're an Israeli. You were right there as a young man in the IDF, and now you're in international business. How do you see the continuous challenges facing Israel and the Middle East in general? You know, they all say that uh, Israel is a great uh, villa in a, in, a, in a lousy neighborhood. That is the current situation here. And uh, the Arab Spring, which many people say will become very soon the Islamic winter, once it dawned on us, that was bad news and everybody could have figured that one out. The Muslim Brotherhood uh, taking over practically Libya, along with, uh, I guess, uh, segments of Al-Qaeda. These are not good news. These are not good news to Israel and these are not good news to the rest of the world, or to the rest of the Western world at least. And uh, I must admit that while I'm a huge, uh, as you know me, if you know me for years, I'm, uh, I'm a dove, I think that U.S. appeasement in this uh, process and non-involvement in this process uh, would make us all unfortunately pay a price uh, over time. So the clouds are gathering over the Middle East. Israel is again very isolated. Israel has its own internal problems. But notwithstanding its internal problems and its problems with the Palestinians, clearly the driving factor of Muslim brotherhoods and other is the, the reluctance to see a foreign body like Israel in the Middle East. Well, it's interesting you use the term appeasement, which reminds me of Neville Chamberlain in prior to World War II, how he thought of peace in our time, making deals with Hitler, and we all know that didn't work out very well. World War II followed. And here we, again we have voices saying that there should be no appeasement, there should be some firm attitude to resolve issues. Yet it's so tragic that the conflict in the Middle East continues and so much more can be achieved in mutual peace. Peace that now exists still, thank God, with uh, Jordan and hopefully will continue with Egypt. How do you see the continuation of the peace process possibly in the Middle East? First of all, let me comment on your, on your Chamberlain parallel here. 
I think you're talking at two distinct uh, situations. I mean, it is one thing uh, to hand over the Sudeten to, to the Germans uh, to try to avoid war. Uh, it's a different story when the people rise in, in countries and ask for what is rightfully theirs. Unfortunately, democracies need more than just the desire to be a democracy. It also needs institutions and parties and uh, and the uh, judiciary and, and so on and so forth. Because otherwise, and what's happened, what happened in those parts of the world is that the ones that are most prepared are the ones who go who rise into power. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood have been preparing for that for decades. Therefore, they are the ones who rise into power, and once they consolidate the power, they will not let go of it. Uh, so it's not that people in the Middle East do not deserve democracy and so on, but they need to be prepared for that, and they need to have the right institutions to allow for democracy to flourish and not just become a mockery like it is becoming in this part of the world. So, uh, and while I would be the first one to support free people's right uh, for self-determination and uh, democracy, I, I think that when democracy is being a mean towards an end, which is not democratic, like an Islamist country, then I think uh, other means should be brought into it. But it is not appeasement in the true sense that uh, Chamberlain used uh, with, with Germany. And as to the question uh, about Israel and about uh, its, its living together with its neighbors, the Middle East is uh, like a kaleidoscope. It's, it's ever-changing and ever-moving and, uh, and, and situation changes. If you take a country like Jordan, who is at peace, Jordan is controlled by Bedouins, actually while majority of the population is Palestinian. So uh, who do you want to make peace with, the people or the, or the regime? The best example we had was Egypt. Uh, during the Mubarak era, uh, the popular notion was that we had peace with Mubarak, not with the Egyptian people. Interesting. So the question is, who are you, who you making peace with? With the dictator or with the people, because the real lasting peace is the one that you're going to strike with the people. But in order to do that, there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be done on, on both uh, sides and mainly on the, and, and not less on the Israeli side. And clearly resolving the issue with the Palestinians is a prerequisite for that, because right or wrong, uh, this is the issue that at the core of the conflict with the Arab world right now. This brings a question up. I spoke with Abba Evan uh, years ago and I asked him this question. Why would the Arabs accept today what they refused to accept up until 1967 when they had East Jerusalem, the West Bank, the Sinai and the Golan? Why would they suddenly accept today what they refused back then? And I asked again, Chaim Yavin the same question, and they said, well, maybe they learned something. Look, I don't think that the Germans are deeply in love with the French, and I don't think that uh, the uh, Valons loves the Flames in Belgium, and so on. So people don't need to be madly in love in order to coexist. And we think that it's only that it's binary. It's either we're at war or we're in love with the Arabs. There's also a, 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 a happy middle here. You know, with Egypt, we were neither at war nor, nor in love. But for the last uh, 33 years, not one shot was fired on the border. Israel saved, they will tell you, somewhere about a billion shekels a year just on not having to put troops on the border with Egypt. And I'm sure that the Egyptians saved a similar amount of money or, sim or, or so on. And everybody was equally unhappy or happy, depends on your point of view. But that's fine. When I'm asked this question, my, my counter reaction is, one thing that makes me think and, and really get puzzled is, we have the strongest army in the Middle East. Why do we care? I mean, we need to do what is right for us. And what's right for us is to have our own country, majority Jewish, a majority Jewish population. And 
how comes that the strongest army in the Middle East is very much worried about a couple of uh, guys with Kalashnikovs? What don't I understand? We have the strongest army in that part of the world, probably one of the strongest in the world. So why are we worried about it? So nothing needs to change over there. Realities need to sink in. Poverty needs to be eradicated. I think that a yeah, full stomach is a huge uh, advancement to peace. Uh, they need to prosper, like we need to prosper. And once everybody has something to lose, then wars become a less favorable solution. When you have nothing to lose, then all you have to do, all you, ha all you have left is fight. So you need to make sure that other parties don't have too many reasons to fight and many reasons to want to keep the peace. So you're optimistic and you see a brighter future in which people will entertain more rational and positive thoughts and hopefully resolve differences. I haven't said that. I mean, first of all, I don't think that the, Israeli, the current Israeli administration is very rational. And I don't truly believe that they are seeking peace uh, at all costs. Uh, if uh, they were, I think uh, more advancement could have been could have been achieved, more progress could have been achieved in, in, in the process. But uh, I don't think that it is not solvable. I think it is solvable. It's actually not that complicated to solve it. I think everybody knows, look, put it differently. If we all agree that the only solution is a two-state solution, if we do not want to have a South Africa in Israel or a democratic country with a minority Jewish population, then the only solution that can work is a two-state solution. We all know where the borders are going to go and going to pass, going to be delineated on a map with many, with very minor nuances that between Every two intelligent people are easily solvable if you really want to solve it. And uh, there will be issues that some people would like to resolve, like we all want the Arabs to fall madly in love with us the day after, or the Palestinians. And why exactly would they be in love with you if you suppress them for 45 years? Uh, if you were Palestinians living in a, in a refugee camp and uh, your doors being knocked by Israeli soldiers in the middle of the night, why would you like them? Uh, those wounds heal very slowly and, and scar and over a very, a very long period of time. But that's fine. That's fine. I mean, this is... We, <laughs> they say that the difference between us and the Arabs is that we want them to marry us and they want to divorce us. Uh, through a peace process. We want a peace process to be achieved and everybody be madly in love with everybody else. And the Arabs want to have a peace process and just say good riddance. And I think this, and, and I, by the way, I support the Arabs, the Arabs, the Arabs on that one. I don't want to be, I don't want to be madly in love with them. I just want to coexist with them. I want to maintain my own prowess in, 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 in that region so nobody We'll, have to get, we'll get the wrong ideas uh, and just go on living my life and let them create enough wealth and own enough things so they would be really worried about losing it. And we do exactly what the Americans have been doing for the last uh, century, speak very softly and carry a huge bet. Well, Chaim, this has been, of course, very interesting. And as mentioned earlier, all we can do is hope for sensible solutions and peace for all concerned. Thank you so very much for being with me. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks for having me. I'll be right back. Deep in Israel's Arava Desert, there is an oasis of hope. Here, students from across the Middle East and around the world are being provided with the knowledge and skills they need to protect the environment they share. 
Everybody needs resources, everybody needs water, everybody needs air, it doesn't matter where you're from. Israelis and Arabs, Jews, Muslims and Christians, future leaders united by the belief that nature knows no borders and the conviction that true coexistence begins with meaningful collaboration. It's taught me to believe. That's the language that we teach. It's the language of trust. We focus on environmental issues from a transboundary perspective um, that um, is based on cooperation with our neighbors. You look at environmental problems in Israel, they are not, for the most part, contained within the borders of Israel. What we do on the, in terms of the environment here will affect what's happening in the West Bank, will affect what's happening in Jordan and vice versa. So if you really want to understand environmental problems, and if you really want to come to um, dressing in a comprehensive and a sustainable way the solutions, the only way to really do it is on a regional cooperative basis. And that's really what we do. That's our expertise, that's our contribution to addressing environmental issues uh, in the Middle East. The Arva Institute is an academic uh, research institution under the auspices of Ben Gurion University. Jews and Arabs in the same room, Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, and students from all over the world for a semester, two semesters, sometimes for longer. There may be a difference of opinion about history or about politics or about why the conflict started in the first place. They all have to learn to live together as angry as they may be about each other. It's not if the Israelis win, the Palestinians lose, and if the Palestinians win, the Israelis lose. It's if one side loses, both sides lose. After spending a year here, they're going to see the Middle East as their home, not just Israel, Palestine, or Jordan. Our alumni are making a critical difference to the dialogue uh, between peoples in the region about environmental issues, about natural resources, and how we need to work together uh, in order to make this place a better place to live in. I think that we prove it here at the RFI Institute every day that we can change people's attitudes, that we can change people's minds, and that we can open up people's hearts to each other. At the end of the semester, where do you go? You leave this bubble, but you don't leave it as you came. You leave it with all those things, with all those information, all those feelings that you learned, all those principles that you learned at the Arba. Where do you take it? You take it back to your society. I take it back to Jordan. People take it back to Palestine. People take it back to Israel, North America. So we are the generation that can make a change. One of the things the RFI Institute has wanted to do was to educate a new generation of leaders who would realize that nature has no borders. We need leaders who believe that there's a future for all of us in the Middle East. And if there's a future for all of us in the Middle East, then we need to start doing something today so that future is bright and clean and healthy and peaceful. This place does attract people who have leadership qualities. And I've met a lot of people with a lot of leadership qualities, people who have ideas bubbling in their brains. It puts faith in you. It says, if you have an idea, tell us, maybe we'll do it. What's the best way to have that kind of impact? Invest in our future, invest in our students, invest in the young generation. This is a non-for-credit uh, program that students are required to attend, and it's where we talk about the things they don't want to talk about. Before I came here, discussing the conflict was really hard for me, because I know there's only one side of the story, it's, uh, it's only my side. You have to learn, and it's very difficult, how to see from the other person's viewpoint and how to still be friends. We discuss one of the most controversial issues that I don't think anybody else outside can find it easy. We have Israeli students who are soldiers who serve at checkpoints and Arab students from Palestinian territories who try to come across those checkpoints. To have peace, we have to talk about history and pain is pain. It's not always a pleasant session. Often students will run out of the room crying, will scream and yell at each other, will be so angry. It was the only place in the world during the war that you can see Palestinians and Israelis 
inside one room crying for the same reason and hugging each other. There won't be any solution for any environmental problem without discussing politics. It's not always easy, but it's one of the hardest and best things that comes out of the program. There is dialogue, and dialogue and compassionate listening is very important towards peace. And this is how I say that it's successful. What I see is students rising to the occasion, dealing with with the complexity of this place in, in such a flexible and resilient and um, just uh, remarkable way. It's, it's, it's amazing to see the, the students succeed. We have to work and talk to each other to save the environment and those bridges, those channels that we built to talk about the, to save the environment, also it adds to what? It adds to that we have the channels opened already to talk about peace, to talk about the hard issues that nobody else can talk about. The Institute work is not done with you when you leave this gate. We have something called the APEN that really connects all the alumni together. The Arva Alumni Peace and Environmental Network was born of the fact that the alumni were finding each other um, out in the field or through us and finding that these were the kinds of people that it was easiest to work with, to start projects, to get advice, things like where would be a good place to study, what's a good program to study in. We have one alumni who is working at the Dead Sea and his boss said to him one day, you know, it would be so nice if we could work with the people on the other side and he said, what's the problem? I'll call the Arva Institute. Through the lectures and the students, I'm sure we can get to the right people and he did. People uh, that were once my students are now my uh, research partners, um, whether it be uh, in Jordan whether it be in Israel. One of my colleagues now is somebody who now works within the Israeli government on dealing with issues that face the Dead Sea. Where Roe is today is in part due to the experiences that he had as a student here at the Institute. We've had the pleasure and the honor to have given them some of the tools to make the next step. I consider myself now ready and skilled to go forward with the peace process. The first reaction of my mom when I told her I want to come and study in Israel, she was she freaked out. She was, are you crazy? You go to Israel? How can you deal with the enemy? This is something that we raised with. My experience with uh, Arabs or Muslims um, in the world was passing in the street in Jerusalem. And suddenly I found Mechon Arava, the Arava Institute, which was talking about environmental studies, um, where Israelis and Arabs study together and also do some peace work, which to me was just a blow. I was like, wow, my, my, actually my heart jumped and I felt it in my stomach and I was like, this is it. It is possible to make a change. It is possible to make a difference that we're not just stuck in this cycle of violence that we can never get out of. It's the only way that we can succeed and we can make, make a change. We are 20 years ahead of the, rest of, the, of the rest of the country and we're 20 years ahead of the rest of the region. I do not know if the kind of work that is going on in the Arava Institute is, can be done anywhere else. I feel filled with, with, with life and happiness when I see the students that way. If we want to make a good future for our future generation, we have all to work together. Today and every day, lives are being changed and the future is being rewritten at the Arava Institute. Find out more about our purpose, programs, and people at www.friendsofarava.org. Join us, because nature and hope know no borders. This brings us to the end of our special show for today. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us.